Honorable the Chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, Honorable President, Honorable Deputy President, Honorable Members of this House, Fellow South Africans and those sitting in the gallery, Bahaitsu Dumela. See, 11 days ago, we lost one of South Africa's literary giants, Professor Andre Brink. Our sadness at his passing is tempered only by his great literature he bequeathed us. Professor Brink taught us a powerful lesson. He taught us that you cannot blame a faceless system for the evils in society. It is human beings that perpetrate wrongs against others. And it is human beings that have the power to correct these wrongs. We would do well, honorable members, to heed these lessons as we debate the state of the nation today. Because if we are to succeed as a nation, we need to start believing in the power of human agency. We need to resurrect the idea that the choices we make, the actions we take, matter. It is true that the uneven legacy of apartheid system weighs heavy on us. It is a fact that black children still do not have the same opportunities as white children. This is a human tragedy that nobody in this house should ever accept. Much has been done to redress the past. Make no mistake. Life in South Africa today is certainly better than it was during apartheid. But we need to hold ourselves to a much higher standard than that. We need to become the nation that President Nelson Mandela helped us believe we could become. A place of hope, prosperity, selfless leadership, and mutual respect. And so I think, honorable members, South Africans, the questions we must ask ourselves today is what is holding us back from achieving Madiba's vision. We can blame apartheid. We can blame the global financial system. We can even blame Jan van Riebeck, if you like. But in our hearts, we know exactly what the problem is. We've allowed those in power to become bigger than our institutions, breaking them down bit by bit. We have indeed allowed one powerful man to get away with too much for far too long. Yeah. Members, this honorable man is in our presence here today. Honorable President, in these very chambers, just five days ago, you broke parliament. Please understand, honorable President, when I use the term honorable, I do it out of respect for the traditions and conventions of this august house. But please don't take it literally. For you, honorable president, are not an honorable man. You're a broken man presiding of a broken society. See, you're willing to break every democratic institution to try and fix the legal predicament you find yourself in. You're willing to break this parliament if it means escaping accountability for the wrongs you have done. You see, on Thursday afternoon, outside this very house, members of parliament were being arrest arrested and assaulted by your riot police. A few hours later, inside this house, our freedom to communicate was violated by an order to jam the telecommunications network. Not long after that, armed police officers in plain shirts stormed into this sacred chamber and physically attacked members of this house. This was more than an assault on members of parliament. It was an assault on the very foundations of our democracy, honorable members. Parliament's constitutional obligation to fearlessly scrutinize and oversee the executive lost all meaning on Thursday night. 
In fact, the brute force of the state won, and the hearts of our nation was broken. We knew at that very moment that our democratic order was in grave danger. But here's the question. What did you do, Mr. President? You laughed. You laughed while the people of South Africa cried for their beloved country. You laughed while trampling Madiba's legacy in the very week that we celebrated 25 years of his release. Honorable President, we will never, ever forgive you for what you did on that day. Madam Speaker, I led my party out of these chambers on Thursday night because we could not sit by and watch while our constitution was being destroyed right in front of us. We could not. In fact, the justices walked out. They walked out with the defenders of the Constitution. When we emerged from this chamber, we had the president reading from the cold and empty words from his prepared text. They were words of a broken man presiding over a broken society. For six years, he has run from 783 counts of corruption, fraud, and racketeering that have haunted him f from before the day he was elected. For six years, this broken man has spent his waking hours plotting and planning to avoid his day in court. In this broken man's path of disruption of, lies a litany of broken institutions, each one of them targeted because of their constitutional power to hold him account. A broken SARS that should have investigated the fringe tax benefits from Nkandla, the palace of corruption that was built by the people's money. A broken NPA that should have continued with its prosecution of the president without fear or favor. A broken SIU, a broken Hawks, a broken SAPS. And so we can go on with the list of institutions President Zuma is willing to break to protect himself and his friends. This is why we're a broken society. Because the abuses do not stop at the door of the union buildings. The power abusing is happening at every level. We have seen many President Zumas in governments, in municipalities, all over South Africa, in fact. Honorable members, I went to Mokhalakwen. I met a woman there who had not been able to bath for days. It wasn't because of me. The lack of water in Mokhalakwena was not a systems failure. It was a failure of your local comrades, to use that term, who in that community have started to fight amongst each other and have long forgotten the people of Mukhalakwini. That's whose fault it was. It was, in fact, that ANC councillors waged a factional war, simply fighting over power, not for the rights of the people of this country. Local police officers with a duty to serve the community have been co-opted by factions to intimidate residents and to suppress protest. As the war rages on, rubbish piles up, sewage pipes continue to leak, and the taps, in fact, run dry. This is all because of broken men presiding over broken towns and broken cities. But they have learned from the best. This is their last line of defense against an electricity crisis that plagues them on a daily basis. The daily struggle of this community-funded organization is just one example of the devastating impact this electricity crisis is having on households, on businesses, on schools, on hospitals, countless other facets of society. Where is this accountability from this broken man who claims to be our president where, when all he can offer is more of the same or is our president? All it does is, keep, is promising to bail out ESCOM and secure its monopoly over power. Load shedding is a crisis that will take our economy to the brink of an economic shutdown.
Our economy has lost 300 billion rand since 2008 to 2008 because without stable electricity supply, manufacturers cannot produce, investors are driven away, and ultimately jobs are lost. That is why, Mr. President, when you stand here and promise more of the same, jobs every year that never materialize, we simply cannot believe you. On Thursday, the President said that the NDP's ambition to grow by 5% by 2019 is at risk as a result of slow global growth and, and, and domestic constraints. How is it then that other SADC countries are growing at a rate, at a rate of 5.6% facing the same external pressures? The answer is our real constraints are because of our policy failures of this particular government. In his nine-point plan, he failed to address the needs of a solid economic infrastructure. Instead, he left the electricity monopoly, monopoly with ESCOM. He gave the broadband monopoly to Telcom and then left Sunrail to toll our roads in Gauteng. The legacy of this will mean more government bailouts and failing infrastructure, leading us to more job losses, more debt, and a broken society. This broken man has indeed broken our economy. Despite all his past promises, what President Zuma uh, failed to tell us last week was that today there are, are 1.6 million more South Africans living without jobs than when he took office in 2009. Living and breathing human beings being robbed of their feeling of self-worth and their ability to provide for their families. From Ikacheng to Nelson Mandela Bay to Soweto, I met unemployed youth who have lost hope in finding a job. They are victims of an unequal education that serves the interest of a powerful teacher union over learners where poorer schools go without textbooks, desks, and proper classrooms. The consequences, as parents in River Lee told me, is that crime and drugs continue to enslave our young people, and drug lords and criminals operate freely within our community. This is the state of a broken society battling under the burdens of unemployment, crime, power cuts, and an unequal education system. South Africa may be a broken society under a broken president, but, honorable members, the spirit of our people is a lot harder to break. We are standing as people today because South Africans were able to free ourselves from the worst form of oppression under apartheid. Today, we have a constitution and a bill of rights that is admired across the world. We have an obligation to future generations of South Africa to make sure that we continue to fight for a fairer society, where there's a greater opportunity for all to live a better life, where the rights and freedoms granted to us by the Constitution are protected. But on Thursday, we received a weak account of the state of the nation from a broken president. We can have a stable electricity supply in South Africa, but a war room isn't certainly going to solve it. The president knows what needs to be done to keep the lights on. And this is it. You've got to break the ESCOM monopoly. As long as they're in charge of the national grid, they will act to prevent any meaningful contributions by independent power producers to our electricity supply. And more seriously, Mr. President, you must abandon the one trillion rands nuclear deal. Future generations will pay for this electricity price hikes while we wait over a decade to see any power. And of course, the secrecy behind this deal means there's scope for corruption on a mega arms deal level, as we've seen. We can and we must have an equal education system where schools are properly resourced, teachers are well trained, and there's a commitment from school principals. There are many hardworking educators out there, but the president ignores the, the need to hold principals and teachers accountable when they fail our children. We believe it's, it, it, it's, it, we believe it's possible for entrepreneurs to flourish with an economy that grows at 8% and, grows and, and creates millions of jobs if we make the right choices. But the government's ideas are stale. We need economic infrastructure that is reliable. We need a tax incentive for established businesses, business people to participate in mentorship program. We need 
a national venture capital fund to startups. We need to roll out opportunity centers where advice and support is readily available. We need a real youth wage subsidy that benefits even the smallest of businesses. We believe our country, for our country, we believe it's possible for our country to be a place where streets are safe and communities are healthy places to raise families where the police are properly managed and trained. But while our communities are overrun by drug lords and the president said nothing about crime on Thursday, where are the specialized anti-drug units? Drug crime has doubled since these were taken away. People don't trust the police. But if the SAPS is going to have its integrity restored, it needs to start right at the top with the National Police Commissioner. Our crime-fighting institutions such as the Hawks, the NPA, and the SIU must be led by people committed to fairness and justice and free from interference from powerful political interests. We believe it's possible to realize a vision of South Africa where every effort is made to redress the legacy of apartheid through a land reform program that truly benefits those who are denied access to land. All the president has offered is a populist proposal to ban foreign land ownership. This will only kill investment and jobs. The 17.5 million hectares of fertile soil in communal, in communal land must be unlocked for reform purposes. State-owned land must be fully audited and used to fast-track the redistribution to deserving beneficiaries. And farm workers must become farm owners in partnership with commercial farmers through the NDP's system of identifying and purchasing available land on the market. Mr. President, who has that document, the NDP, the one that the ministers don't read, that one. That's the one there. But we all know, Mr. President, that half of the people who are sitting behind you don't support the NDP and will not implement it. Only through bold reforms that go to the heart of the problem will we meaningfully redress the legacy of restricted access to land. National Council uh, uh, Chairperson, the tide is turning in our country. And as Professor Brink wrote in his most celebrated work, A Dry White Season, the image that presents itself is one of water, a drop held back by its own inertia for one last moment, though swollen of its own weight before it irrevocably falls, as if the water, already sensing its own imminent fall, continues to cling against the pull of gravity to its precarious stability, trying to prolong it as much as possible. Madam Speaker, let me help you. Change may seem slow, but it is coming. There is a swell starting to build, and when the wave crashes, it will sweep away this broken man out of power. When... That when that happens, we will be there to start fixing our broken society and unleash the potential of every South African. That is why the party I lead in this parliament will not join other parties in breaking down our institution. Because one day, when we are in government, we will want the very same institutions and this parliament to hold us to account. And so, we will work within the institutions of democracy to hold this government to account. And we will continue creating opportunities for all where we govern. We will work tirelessly to build a truly democratic alternative in South Africa. Indeed, I stand before you pronouncing that for my children and your children, their future can only be pride under the DA when we come into power. That change is coming, and I would propose you get ready for it. We will restore power to the people. Ngosi Sigeleli Africa, Morena Bolokas Chavasayesu. Let us live and strive for freedom in South Africa, our land. I thank you very much.